Thank you so much for coming this evening, and thank you, Dan. I couldn't think of a better that time driving slowly over Antarctica with. Uh, and it's wonderful to see Dan be the director of sustainability. He brings great skills uh, to the job, science, engineering, logistics, a variety of things. Uh, today, as you can see from the title, I'll be talking about climate change. Uh, I, I, it's actually a several part presentation. The first is a very brief description of the Climate Change Institute, a uh, little bit of a story about uh, what actually kick-started some of the discoveries that uh, my team and I have been involved in. Uh, and then I'll talk about the reason that climate change is so important, of course. I give a couple of primary examples uh, that come from our research and obviously many other people have been working too. Then I'll talk four approaches to climate change. It's a slightly different way than you've heard about it before. Uh, and I'll process uh, provide a way in which you can tell the difference between scientific evidence and alternative facts. So first, the Climate Change Institute. Uh, we have about 135 people in the Institute. Uh, we have been around for about 44 years. Uh, in fact, one of our previous directors, George Denton, is in the back of the room here. Uh, we are one of the oldest climate research units in the world. Uh, and we're very multidisciplinary. We look at chemical, biological, physical, and social aspects of climate change. So you can see here with the arrows in the middle, uh, we do actually three different things when we uh, think about climate change, not only multidisciplinary, but in the middle, we look at the climate record written by humans that goes back really only about 100 years in any significant detail. We also look at remotely sensed data, but in order to get an idea of how the natural climate system operates, how fast changes can occur, how large warming or cooling can be, we go back through time and we use several different techniques. One of them is ice coring, which my teams have been involved in primarily, but we also look at glacial geology to tell the former extent and decay of ice masses, lake sediments, even archaeology, which allows us to tell how people reacted to climate. And we take all of this information, and on the far right side, we do monitoring uh, in the modern world. We look at changes in ice extent. We look at how lakes have changed as a consequence of pollution. We map coastal changes in Maine, a variety of things. And our whole primary goal is to make better predictions for future climate, uh, because there is no escape over the next few decades, and in fact already, we're experiencing dramatic changes. One of the things that binds our institute together is the study of ice. Not everybody, not all 130 people in the institute study ice, but many of us do. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for looking at ice. This particular picture is from the Rongbu Glacier. This is the glacier that we climb up uh, to get to Everest. We've spent five seasons very close to the top of Everest. And if you take a look at the 1968 extent of the Rongbu Glacier compared to the 2007, you can see there's been a dramatic change. And if you take a look at this sort of mapped and idealized form all over the planet, literally all of the small mountain glaciers in the world, not everyone, but literally almost all, uh, are, are, have begun to shrunk significantly since the 1970s. Glaciers don't lie. Uh, when a glacier gets smaller, it's a consequence of warmer temperatures or less precipitation. And they can monitor the changes in climate over, in the case of mountain glaciers, decades uh, to multiple decades. There are also two large ice sheets on the planet. Uh, one, of course, is Greenland. And when the Greenland ice sheet melts, when it does, not necessarily tomorrow, not necessarily in the near future, it potentially will increase sea level six to seven meters. And then, of course, there's the Antarctic ice sheet, which ties up about 58 meters of sea level equivalent in it one and a half times the size of the United States, surrounded by sea ice that doubles the size of the continent, average thickness of the ice 6,000 feet. Both Greenland and Antarctica, because they're much larger, really tell us something about longer term changes in the climate system. And around their edges, and in some cases, in the case of Greenland, over the surface, they're being impacted already. So the thing that my teams uh, focus on is really the recovery of ice cores 
which can tell us season by season, going back years, decades, centuries, millennia, all of the things that you see up here, past temperature, precipitation, atmospheric circulation patterns, and all the others that you can read up here. And I, I should go back here one second. This gives you a, just a very quick overview, the dots of the idealized places uh, that my teams and I have worked all over Antarctica, uh, the Andes, the Southern Ocean, collected ice from Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Arctic in North America. So after spending about eight years working in Antarctica between my graduate degree and early on in my career, uh, I decided that I loved what I was doing, uh, but because I was working in Antarctica, I assumed it couldn't possibly have anything of value related to humans. So uh, while I continued to work in Antarctica and do right up to this day, I thought I ought to spread out. And if you want to use glaciers to tell you something about people, then you need to go to where both exist. And certainly the Indian subcontinent is a place where there are tons of glaciers and many people. And of course, uh, this Indian subcontinent and the Himalayas, the 5,200 glaciers of the Himalayas, uh, which not only hold records that we are interested in recovering using ice cores, but these glaciers dominate uh, the water availability for people to the south and to the north. And they are, the whole region is dominated by what's called uh, the Indian monsoon. It's one of the greatest atmospheric phenomena on the planet. And during the summer, the red air masses come off the ocean and they're going to be warm and moist and they'll have agricultural signals in them. And during the winter, there's 180 degree reversal and cold, dry air masses, dusty air masses come off the Tibetan plateau. So the goal, I thought, would be to try to figure out something about the behavior of this monsoon. But when I started working in the late 1970s, 1980s in the Himalayas, in particular in India, we weren't allowed to have maps. There were no satellite images that covered the places that I thought I might like to go. There were some, but they were mostly cloud cover, and we weren't allowed to have any form of commu communication. So we went into these regions effectively blind. The one thing that I had was a report, a book that had been written by a very famous climber at the turn of the century, uh, Fanny Bullock Workman, and there she is right up there. Fanny Bullock Workman, she did some of the first major climbs in the Himalayas. And in her book was a picture, you can see one of them in the upper left, of a place called Nun Kun. And I thought, wow, looks like a good place to go ice coring. It's about 20,000 feet high uh, in a remote area. I thought it had all the right characteristics for whatever I knew at the time. And when we eventually got there, I took this picture, which replicates pretty much where she was. Uh, so on the way there, I had uh, five students with me, uh, and we needed help. We had a lot of equipment to carry up to 20,000 feet. Went to the very last village before the glacier, and this is a place very close to the border with Pakistan. Uh, it was during the Afghan-Soviet War. Uh, these villagers were the few people that I could find to help us carry loads up and down, uh, and I hired 40 of them, and we had great experiences together for the next few weeks. Uh, by the end of six weeks, we had finally made it to the place where we were going to start working. Uh, in order to get there, however, we, our team, 40 porters plus the six of us, all carrying very heavy loads, had to go over three 500-foot icefalls multiple times, uh, carrying the gear up there. Again, no communication, uh, no maps. But when we got up there, we drilled an ice core, did our work, but the most exciting thing that happened happened on one day. It was one fortuitous day. And on that day, air masses came from the Tibetan Plateau, and air masses came from the ocean, uh, and they precipitated snow. And the ones from the Tibetan Plateau were precipitating snow closer to 20,000 feet, the ones coming from lower down at the lower elevation. So we had the idea of going from 20,000 feet down to 10,000 feet, sampling this fresh snow, and then coming back up to spend the night up there because we thought maybe there is a chemical signature in these air masses. And if in fact there is a chemical signature in these air masses, you can track the past history of these air masses. And now with this amazing rendition provided by NASA, 
Uh, this is uh, 2006, it's clicking through the minutes and hours, and it shows you com combined satellite imagery. This is from a time, of course, we had no maps at all. Now you have this phenomenal satellite imagery, and it shows chemical fingerprinting of air masses. Here in the southern hemisphere, the light blue, this is sea salt uh, that's being in, uh, involved or, or incorporated in air masses as they make their way around Antarctica. The green is biomass burning coming off uh, South America, the Amazon from Africa. As you make your way farther north, the orange is dust coming off the Sahara. And if you look carefully, you see that that dust makes its, all, all, its way all the way into the Western Hemisphere. And then in the Northern Hemisphere, the white that's circling along is actually represents sulfate aerosols, pollution in the atmosphere. So those are four chemicals that are related to these air masses, but of course there's a lot of chemistry you can measure. So you can not only see that an air mass went over the ocean, you can see it went over the land and, ver and determine a variety of other things. So why does this matter? Who cares about atmospheric circulation pattern patterns? This is why. The atmosphere transports heat, moisture, and pollutants. Obviously when the wind blows from the south, we know we're going to have a warm day in Maine and vice versa from the north. In addition to transporting those three very important things, of which moisture is extremely important depending upon where you live in the world, uh, air masses also drive sea surface currents, and air masses embed their temperature signal into the ocean, which is then sustained and can be transported around the ocean. So in truth, if we only knew one thing about the climate, it probably, in my opinion, would, be, would need to be atmospheric circulation. Uh, but of course, we would have never figured out that the planet is warming if it had been up to me. Whoops. So I'm going to ask basically two big questions that, uh, that I'll answer using the information that we and other people, but primarily we have uh, gathered. And the first, and there are many questions we can answer, but I've just chosen two as an introduction. Uh, have humans really impacted the climate system and what are the consequences? So this is a quick summary diagram that shows you what we and other people have found. This record goes from obviously today back 5,000 years, remember 5,000 years, uh, and all of these things, greenhouse gases, radioactive material, toxic substances, on and on and on, as you see in the red box, have all increased dramatically in the last few decades. The reason I focused on 5,000 years is that the real axis on here wouldn't go back 5,000 years. It would go back at least 100,000 years based on what we know. But if I'd done that, you wouldn't be able to see the little box in the last few decades. <clears throat> and I'll make the bold statement that the chemistry of the atmosphere today is unsurpassed in Earth history. That's a very big statement, but it's an important statement. We have never had the combination of chemistry of atmosphere that we experience today, humans and the ecosystem, which means that as time goes on, we're going to begin to adapt to a different sort of chemistry of the atmosphere than our predecessors did. So that was the nasty part of the story, <clears throat> at least about the chemistry of the atmosphere. Here's the good part of the story, three quick ones. One of the things, of course, that happened after Hiroshima were above ground bomb tests. They'd spread radioactivity all over the planet. And we know that because we can pick up bomb peaks at the South Pole, in the center of Greenland, and all of the Alpine glaciers. It's a marker that we use. However, because of the nuclear test ban theory, uh, nuclear test ban treaty, above ground bomb testing was stopped. And the only event that actually we see since then, and we were the first to discover it, is the Chernobyl nuclear accident. I say the first to discover it, in our case, at the South Pole. So that radioactivity, despite the fact that it's stopped by about the 1960s, maybe early 1970s, is sitting in the groundwater all over the world. And it's actually collected in pockets. It decays, but it's an important toxic hazard, obviously. The important thing is legislation was effective. The next thing that we've been able to look at is acid rain. There's several ways of looking at the history of acid rain. These are ice cores that come from uh, Greenland, from Europe, from the Arctic. And if you take a look on the bottom, that's the known emission history for sulfuric acid. Uh, and you can see that it's reflected 
In all of these ice cores, you get this large spike in sulfuric acid. And as of the advent of the Clean Air Act, or certainly by about 1980, we begin to see the levels drop substantially. Another amazing legislative su success. And then the third impressive legislative success is related to lead. In the case of lead, we see the rise in lead because of the uh, of automobiles emitting lead from leaded fuels, lead related to a whole sort host of industrial processes. Uh, we see the first drop in lead occurring around 1980 in the United States because of the Clean Air Act. We see the second drop slightly later occurring in Europe. And then when we did our sampling in what turned out to be Alaska, which is a good place to monitor Chinese lead emissions, uh, by about 2000, they had not done, had any legislation. But since 2000, they brought in legislation. And if we went back to the same place, we'd see the lead levels drop. So glaciers don't lie, ice cores don't lie, they have no reason to lie uh, about the success of legislation. Now, there are always two sides to a story in terms of human emissions. Greenhouse gases obviously capture heat, warm the planet. Uh, the unfortunate thing is they are globally distributed and they stay in the atmosphere for a long time, centuries in the case of CO2. However, things like lead, cadmium, particulates, acid rain, these things that have a tremendous impact on the health of humans and the ecosystem, they only last in the atmosphere a matter of days. And the proof is what happened during 9-11. During 9-11, when the aircraft was shut down over the United States, it was the cleanest that the air had been in decades. So we have the possibility through legislation already demonstrated to reduce the levels of many of these things because they're, they don't travel very far in the atmosphere. So I, I've coined the term over the years, the toxic climate cocktail, which we've produced. And it sounds a bit, a bit depressing, certainly, not when you think about our ability to clean up the atmosphere and ideally to mitigate the levels of greenhouse gases. But here's a list of the things that make this a toxic climate cocktail. Greenhouse gas warming, of course, leads to vector-borne diseases like ticks, uh, transfer of all sorts of Parasites that impact lobster, uh, these are parasites that do better in warm water, leads to drought, and I'll talk about how warming leads to drought. Uh, it leads to respiratory disease in the form of small particulates, neurological diseases, cancers, and of course, when you look at the ocean, ocean acidification, the ocean is our largest source. I think close to 70% of our food has the potential for coming uh, from the ocean. And of course, invasive species, which are a very dominant impact in the ocean off the coast of Maine uh, and inland. So two quick, three quick examples from Maine about the impact of humanly emitted substances. One is the migration of Lyme ticks. Uh, my wife and I moved to Maine in 2000. We came from New Hampshire. We used to take 60 ticks a day off our dogs. We were so excited about coming to Maine because there were no Lyme ticks. Now, of course, there are Lyme ticks migrating as a consequence of warming. Heat frequency. We're not only an older population, but more importantly, we're a population that is not used to having to cool the climate. And as studies demonstrate that when the temperature goes from 74 to 79 degrees Fahrenheit, the likelihood of people being admitted to hospital as a consequence of heat illness doubles. And the estimate is by the middle of the century that the number of days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, forget about 79 degrees Fahrenheit, that it will triple by mid-century. So we will have significantly more uh, distress related to heating. In 2003, 23,000 people in Europe died in the summer uh, from the extreme heating conditions. And of course, we all know that the Gulf of Maine is the or second fastest warming body of marine water on the planet and what impact that's ha having on fisheries. If you wanted to study one thing, and we can't in our institute study everything, and certainly our, my small team can't, uh, the thing that, that we chose was air. We wanted to know even more about air pollution because we'd studied it, seen the changes, the legislative successes, and we wanted to study air because, in truth, if you have enough money, you can probably drink clean water, you can eat good, clean food, but you cannot escape the air that you live in. And if you look at the statistics here, 
from the World Bank, one in 10 deaths worldwide is related, are related to, uh, to uh, pollution exposure. Uh, and that ends up being about 7 million premature de deaths a year as a consequence of air pollution. So it would be nice if we knew how clean our air was. We know it's cleaner than it used to be, we, at least in the la uh, relative to the last 50, 60 years, we know it's much dirtier than it was in the distant past. EPA has put together a remarkable data set of air quality. Some of those stations are in Maine, and then they're distributed all over the country. So we got together with the School of Computing and Information Sciences, supported by the Heinz Endowment, supported by the university, supported by NSF, and partnered with Garand, uh, advertising firm in Portland to come up with a nice, simple way in which you could understand your air quality. We call the 10 Green, and in fact, Dan Dixon was one of the people involved in this project. And we came up with a, uh, through Garand, we came up with a simple number that you can first look at uh, that tells you on a scale of one to 10, 10 being best, how good your air quality is. Turns out that we, those 10 numbers are based on the 10 EPA registered pollutants, and quite obviously, things like the, very, the two types or three types of greenhouse gases are always red, which means unhealthy everywhere in the world. So nobody gets any better than an eight. So six is not so bad for Orono, uh, but there is another red in Orono, and that's related to large particulates. The small particulates are actually the worst ones. So with this software, which you can access on your smartphone or any computer, you can compare Orono to Los Angeles. No big shock that the air quality is better here than in Los Angeles. But if you were thinking about looking for a great place to live and you had two jobs of equal quality, you might want to go to a place where the air was better because your chances of living longer and not getting a disease are significantly increased if you live in a place with good air quality. And then you can drill down on this app and you can take a look at the distribution of, in this particular case, small particulate levels, red again being unhealthy, all over the United States, and that shows all of the stations, and you immediately find out that small particulates in the United States are in general not at healthy levels, which is one of the potential explanations for respiratory disease and possibly asthma. If you do the same sort of thing for cadmium, you will find out also that a large part of the United States has just beyond, or I should say just, just slightly unhealthy, if not significantly unhealthy levels of cadmium. And cadmium is critically important because it's one of the potential causes uh, for autism in infants. Oops. So next big question we asked ourselves, we demonstrated uh, in one way that humans had clearly impacted the climate system. Next question is how fast can climate change? And in order to look at this, in the late 1980s, I ended up leading a very large $25 million program. It included 25 universities. We ran for six years, spent 24 months in the field total, drilling from the top of the Greenland ice sheet down just over 3,000 meters, about two miles, uh, right into bedrock and produced the first and still most continuous, most detailed, annually resolved record of the climate system. Precipitation, temperature, atmospheric circulation patterns, uh, sea ice extent, biological productivity in the ocean, on and on. And we used this record for a variety of things. There were phenomenal deep sea records out there, lower resolution, but we could compare them, see how the ocean and the atmosphere was related. And the big contribution that my group made to this was to understand that, in fact, the, the atmosphere cha could change its state very, very quickly. So first, let me show you what the actual change is while you read the text on the left. The change is as follows. This is the position of the edge of the jet stream during the summer. Uh, obviously, stays fairly far north. And then in the winter, it moves farther south. And the jet stream is the dividing point between cold air to the north and warm air to the south. It turns out that this jet stream, for a variety of reasons, which I'll show in a moment, can actually snap from one position to the other and literally get stuck there for a while. It could, for example, stay in its winter position not three months, but nine months, and the same for the summer position. And in the process, 
It impacts storm frequency, intensity, precipitation, temperature, and it can happen in less than one to two years. If you think a political cycle is fast, take a look at climate. This is a very important finding because up to this point, the assumption was that the climate system operated very slowly. And if the climate system operated slowly, it doesn't really matter what what sort of greenhouse gases you put in there, the whole system would take forever to respond. That's not the case. It can respond very, very quickly. So what causes these things? The cartoons show you all of the basic things that control the climate system. Upper left is relationship between the Earth and the sun. And that operates on very long time scales, tens of thousands of years. But all the things with stars can operate fast enough to trigger an abrupt climate change, either by themselves or potentially together. And as it turns out, all of these things with stars, these are all things that happen in the natural climate system, but all of these things with stars are also potentially impacted by humans. Without a doubt, greenhouse gases, I'll talk more about that. Without a doubt, the way the ocean circulates uh, heat and salt, you, all you have to do is dump a little bit of fresh water out of Greenland and you change that path. Without a doubt, the way glaciers expand and uh, contract as you warm, you can get cracks along the edges, change the size of glaciers. And although humans have no impact on solar variability, it turns out that the energetic particles that come from the sun and hit our atmosphere actually impact the levels of ozone in the atmosphere, like the Antarctic ozone hole. That's a humanly derived uh, change in the levels of stratospheric ozone. So we operate in some ways like solar variability. We can obviously change dust content. And although humans do not create volcanic events, we do, like volcanoes, give off sulfur into the atmosphere, which has a cooling effect. So you've all seen this before. This is from an ice core. This is CO2 going from its Normal range, 180 to 280. By 2013, we hit 400. Here's the project, projection for 2100. <clears throat> We're beyond levels, certainly, of the last 800,000 years, which is very important. But the other thing I think that's even more important is that the levels of CO2 have increased 100 times faster than they ever have in any records that we see going back at least 800,000 years. And of course, we're introducing a new greenhouse gas. Uh, I shouldn't say a new one. Uh, methane levels have been rising along with CO2, but we're introducing a new potential source because of Arctic warming. Uh, as the permafrost melts, more and more methane will be given off. The good thing is methane only stays 50 years in the atmosphere. The bad thing is that de methane is 30 times more effective in trapping heat than CO2. And if you go to the Arctic and you decide that you want to get warm and you and you don't have a fuel source, just dig a hole in the snow, throw a match in, and there's a good chance that you'll have a fire uh, from the methane that's tra being trapped beneath the snow. So when we think about the rise in greenhouse gases, its effect on the planet, this is one way of looking at it. This, is, this com work comes from NOAA. NOAA does a phenomenal job of collecting US and international data, putting it together in a synthesis, and clearly by about 1940, there are the first hints of warming. Potentially, the levels never got much higher because of introduction of sulfur, uh, human source sulfur from coal in the atmosphere. <clears throat> 1980, the greenhouse, uh, sorry, the Clean Air Act kicks in. We lower sulfur in the atmosphere. Good thing, we got rid of acid rain, but it allowed greenhouse gases to begin to accelerate more. And, this is the global mean view of land and ocean uh, uh, temperatures going obviously from 1880 to the present. But nobody lives in the global mean temperature. Uh, so we, <clears throat> and in particular, I shouldn't even say we, I should really just say Sean Burkle, who's in our institute, got all his ad advanced degrees from our institute and his undergraduate degree also from the University of Maine, who's now the Maine State Climatologist, put together a software package that is, and I can tell you this without, uh, without any sort of uh, worry, the very, m the most superior application of large amounts of data for this purpose in the world. Uh, we get 1,000 to 1,500 hits a day on his climate reanalyzer software. And it allows you to do a whole series of things. Look at the, uh, the daily climate, go back through time, and a variety of other things. So let's, do the first test with Climate Reanalyzer. Let's see how different 
the temperature is around the world, not just a time series, but around the whole world, how much warmer is it here, this time period, compared to this time period? So a climate reanalyzer, and you can use your smartphone for this too, <clears throat> climate reanalyzer shows us that there's a bit of warming along the edge of Antarctica. Interestingly enough, the Southern Ocean is cooling. Well, the reason it's cooling is because the winds are actually picking up in the Southern Ocean and drawing cold water up. That's a consequence of greenhouse gas warming and the Antarctic ozone hole. But we're really focusing more here on the Northern Hemisphere. And in the Northern Hemisphere, it is clear that the continental interior, and in particular, the Arctic is experiencing temperatures on the order of four degrees centigrade higher for the last 15 years compared to the previous 20 years. Now let's zoom in a little bit more, also with Climate Reanalyzer. The graphics are just phenomenal. And we see here, if we look at this five-year period, 2007 to 2012, compare it to the 20 years prior, roughly prior to that, and we again see that this warming is not just, uh, it's focused, it exists throughout the Arctic, but the highest warming on the order of five degrees centigrade is right here in the Russian Arctic, the part of the Arctic Ocean that has opened, which the Russians have now have vessels. I think they have 100 icebreakers that go back and forth, freighters going back and forth, and the place that, in fact, will eventually allow ships to go from Asia right into Portland, Maine, changing the entire character of certainly that area, if not uh, Maine in general. And if you take a look at this very same plot, but change it into what are called annual melting degrees, which actually is, means the length of the summer, you find out that there are parts of the Arctic in which the length of the summer has doubled. This is, without a doubt, an abrupt climate change event. And we have been talking about abrupt climate change events of this type since the early 90s, and now we actually have one. And I'm not saying we necessarily predicted when it was coming, but it's here. And the people in the Arctic understand without a doubt their lives and the ecosystem, the life of the ecosystem has changed dramatically too. And if we take a look without going into detail and see how this compares to the past record, the, not the aerial extent, but the, the rate, five years, and the magnitude, doubling of the summer, is equivalent to the change in temperature that occurred between the remnants of the last ice age and the beginning of modern day climate about 11 and a half thousand years ago. So we have experienced something very, very important in terms of the way the climate system uh, operates. And part of the reason that there's been so much more change in the Arctic is not only is the sea ice melted, but when the sea ice is gone, uh, you no longer reflect radiation off white surfaces, the ocean absorbs heat, and the ocean also gives off heat. So it, it, it's a it's the perfect amplification of a heating process. What does this do to the atmosphere? Which, of course, is the th one of the big things that, uh, that our group cares about. It does the following thing, which turns out to be very important throughout the Northern Hemisphere. We, whoops, sorry. The um, Arctic has gotten significantly warmer, in parts five degrees centigrade in five years. The middle latitudes have gotten a bit warmer, and the bottom line is that the temperature difference between the polar areas and the middle latitudes is less than it was 10 years ago. And when that lessens, the gradient lessens, and when the gradient lessens, the dividing line, which is that jet stream, the west to east winds, that dividing line it becomes more blurred. It tends to become more wavy. Uh, and when it becomes more wavy and no longer separates the warmth from the cold air, it allows uh, warm air from the south to go north and vice versa, and it's beautifully displayed in this here. The, and remember, the more surface area that you have warm coupled up against cold air, the more storms you have. The more elongated uh, these embayments of the jet stream become, the more you leave one air, area cold, another area warm, one area uh, wet, another area dry. So we've now set into a time period in which we will have great instabilities in climate as a consequence of the heating of the Arctic throughout the entire northern hemisphere. Just to give you another example, also from Climate Reanalyzer, the, if you look at what happened December 30th, 2015, and this has repeated itself this year, this is just one example, 
The shape of the jet stream uh, looked like this, cold air to the north, warm air to the south of the jet stream. You can see what's happening here. And if you look at the temperature on that day, in the middle of the winter, obviously dark, the North Pole was above freezing. And this has happened now several times each winter. Very, very, so this is not that it's impossible in the last 100 years, but the frequency of this is becoming more and more dramatic. And as that warm air goes farther and farther uh, north, then of course it has greater impacts on sea ice extent. And if we translate this into economic uh, results, warm and cold air coming together causes instabilities, extreme weather events, storms, droughts, uh, storm surges, floods. And if you go and look in this particular case of what Munich Re, Munich Re and Swiss Re are the two major reinsurance companies in the world. That means they insure all of the insurance companies. They care mostly about catastrophes. And if you take a look at the red here are earthquakes and volcanic events, not humans. Everything else is related to humans and the levels have gone up. And you can read for yourself the, the hundreds of billions of dollar cost, not, to, not even considering, unfortunately, all of the people who were lost in the process. Uh, next. Good. Okay. So I think if you start to put together some of the things that I've said, you might begin to agree that climate change is, in fact, a security issue. And I'll give you four quick reasons why I consider it to be a security issue. It impacts our health and resource depletion, everything from ve vector-borne diseases uh, to uh, storms to water quality, ecosystem upheaval. It impacts our economy. Uh, and one quick example is that one good positive example, the solar industry now employs more people in the coal industry. So the idea that jobs are disappearing because of renewable energy is not entirely true. Uh, another quick example, catastrophes. I gave you a couple of, of examples of why, in fact, flood and drought might occur. And then geopolitically, as the Arctic Ocean becomes our latest exposed ocean, there's a whole new ocean uh, that's emerging on the planet that we had no access to before, obviously there are a lot of political ramifications related to it. When you think about climate refugees that are going to be displaced as a consequence of all of the extreme weather and the drought. Right now, there are 63 million people who are refugees as a consequence of what's going on in the Middle East. The estimate is 100 million people in terms of uh, climate change. And there are not only going to be dry areas, there are also going to be water tower countries. We work in one of them, uh, Tajikistan. Tajikistan has more ice than any other part of the world outside of the polar regions. It is completely surrounded by dry countries. Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, China, uh, Iran, Uzbekistan. And as things become more and more tense, small landlocked Tajikistan is obviously going to become a political hotspot because it has the water. The other place is Lesotho. Lesotho is in the middle of South Africa, a very dry country, except for Lesotho in the middle because it's very high, gets a lot of rainfall. They sold all of their water resources to South Africa. Now the levels of rain coming into Lesotho are dropping off, and they're having to buy their water back from South Africa. So you put together all of these things, the, uh, the presence of climate change, the fact that it's important to mitigate greenhouse gases, mitigate, uh, create better air quality, adapt, uh, look for new opportunities, create transparent access to data so that we can understand what's going on, on and on. These are the, the words that come together and immediately make one think, how do you actually build something out of this? And then you add to that, Denial and ideology. It's hard to fight against ideology because if the ideology is simply based on this is what I think, it's sort of the end of the story. Uh, but if, in fact, denial is based on, on showing facts that can be debated against other facts, then you have a possibility for uh, finding a solution. So what I've done is I've put together a list of four approaches to climate change. Uh, and this is sort of the, the last part of the talk. And these four approaches to climate change, I think, more or less summarize uh, <clears throat> what the problem is. And I 
hope that by the end of these four approaches that you'll see what some of the logical conclusions might be. The first is surprise. Well, we have operated in the climate system largely based on surprise. Uh, Arctic sea ice depletion was a big surprise. The acid, acid rain was a big surprise. Antarctic ozone hole was a big surprise. And everything else listed on here was a big surprise to us. Uh, and that's simply because it crept up on us. We didn't understand the system uh, well enough, and we didn't have any experience. We didn't have access to the large amounts of data that we have now. But in some cases, the red stars, there have been, there's been legislative successes. Uh, and in the case of the lighter colored stars, this being legislation, it has been success, successful, but perhaps not perfectly successful. Some areas obviously still have uh, bad air quality, and we don't legislate against all forms of air pollution. So surprises are out there. They'll perhaps continue, but the, if we can reduce the likelihood of surprises in the future by understanding what's going on, that would be much better rather than reacting to a surprise. So the second of the climate approaches is a super substantive approach. Uh, for the last roughly 20 years, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has come out with a report about every five years that is a consensus report bringing together many, many people. And let me just show you, uh, this is just part of their website, just to show you how respectable this thing is, 2007, they got the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, it is based on, if we go to, for example, uh, there are four different volumes, and if we go to the one on the far right up here, it's the Climate Change Synthesis, Re Synthesis Report uh, for policymakers. The most recent came out in 2014, and it is a consensus report with hundreds of authors, hundreds of reviewers. It is base, it's a multidisciplinary approach. It's supported by the World Meteorological Organ Organization, the United Nations. There are meetings that go on, multiple meetings every single year to produce all of these different volumes, which add up to uh, several hundred pages. It's based on thousands of peer-reviewed scientific papers that have been accepted in prestigious journals. Uh, and if we just look at the summary alone, which is 32 pages, it has tons of figures, and it backs up the four volumes. And just as a reminder, this is based on hundreds of authors and hundreds of reviewers. It is the least common denominator understanding of climate change. And I use that term in a very positive way, because you have many different countries coming together, many different types of scientists, policymakers, people coming in with various agendas. And if they can conclude a series of statements that they feel is true, that's a big deal, uh, even if it is the least common denominator. So this, these are a couple of things that they say. Top human influence on the climate system is clear. And the second big thing that they say is that there, have been, there has been significant warming in recent decades. And of course, they go on more and more after that. <clears throat> but let me just show you a couple of examples of the information that they provide in the hundreds of pages of text and hundreds of figures. Uh, and they tell you that the temperature since about 1900 globally has ris risen one degree centigrade. Remember that in the Arctic, it's risen five degrees uh, centigrade in just five years. Sea levels increased 20 centimeters since 1900. Carbon dioxide's increased by 1.4 times. You can read methane, nitrous oxide. And of course, the human source of that CO2 has increased seven times. So this is information that comes from a compilation and a synthesis of tons and tons of vetted data. The next thing that they do is they provide perspective about how the temperature has changed. And they show you the most detailed information, which goes back to about 1850 or so. They extend that back a little bit farther. And you can see that the last few decades are significantly warmer than anything in the last roughly 300 years. And then they add on to that going back about 1,200 years. And you can see that there were warm times during the medieval warm period. And that if you believe this record as it's, as it's shown, that black line shows you where we're going today. We have exceeded the warmest temperatures of the medieval warm period. 
but we've just started to do this. So we haven't necessarily seen exactly all of the things that came during the medieval warm period, one of which was wine growing in southern England. They may be good with beer. I don't think they're that good with wine, though. And they also have uh, a synthesis of impacts. Again, this is only in the summer report. And I won't go in th through any details here, but they obviously break down the impacts in terms of glacier changes, biological changes, uh, human and managed systems, food production, livelihood, how these have been impacted as a consequence of climate change, humanly induced, largely humanly induced climate change. So let's go to the third approach. The third approach is that climate change is a hoax. Uh, and that in fact, climate change data and discussion should be limited. Uh, so let's take a look find a way in which we can actually compare in some sort of apples and apples. How does the IPCC compare to what, in fact, cl climate change is a hoax compares? And as it turns out, there's a report that came out from the Heartland Institute. The Heartland Institute is probably the best known uh, organization in the country uh, for climate denial. It has a budget of about $5 million a year. It does not have any scientists on the staff. It has set staff about 20 people. Uh, it's largely supported by the Koch brothers. And their job is to basically pick away at climate change science and show that it's not true. So they came out. 2014 was the last IPCC report. And they came out in 2015 with this report. It's called the NIPCC. It's the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change. So let's compare this to just the 32-page synthesis summary in the IPCC 2014. The comparison is as follows. Uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, it has three authors, not hundreds of authors. It has probably 30 reviewers. Uh, some of them are climate scientists. Very few are. It has three figures compared to hundreds of figures. And it has 250 references compared to thousands and thousands of references. And half of those references are actually in support of human impact on climate change. But what they did was they took sections out of the sentences uh, and sort of put dots on the sides where they, of the words that they didn't really want to deal with. This isn't the way scientists write papers. Scientists don't quote things, and particularly they don't take a phrase out of context. The three people that wrote it, Fred Singer, we had at our institute a few years ago. He's actually a very interesting man. Uh, but his background is that he fought the tobacco industry on behalf of the Heartland Institute, believes that tobacco is not necessarily bad for you. And these other two, uh, this fellow has a little bit of a climate background, the other one barely. Let's take a look at their figures, their scientific data. Uh, there are three. This looks a little blurry. I don't want to be trite, but it actually doesn't look any better in the actual article. Uh, and it shows you what three models say about uh, rise in temperature. I don't, there are no particular, well, there are numbers on here. And then it shows you that the models overshot what the observations were. This is a big generalization. The observations of climate change don't look like this. They actually look like this. And the truth of the matter is that the models got the trend correctly and in fact, in some cases, underestimated what the temperatures were. They make this look based on one paper, and this is a, a, a fellow with a bit of science. Actually, this is Lord, Mo Lord Moncton from Britain, uh, and he does not have a science background, but he's written a quite a few papers. Here's another paper. Again, this is, there are only three figures in the entire document. This is Lord Moncton's uh, plot uh, demonstrating that there has been no change in temperature in the last roughly 30 years. And this one actually comes from a very legitimate source. It basically shows uh, that climate modeling does not exactly reproduce what the observations say. And there's some truth to that. Uh, but it's not. The climate models do a great generalized job of showing us the direction. So let's take the four pages that they use uh, where their primary bullet statements are and in, in which they say they try to prove that the IPCC and climate change produced by humans is not correct. Uh, you can read down through all of these. I didn't want to do what they did and just take a couple of words out of context. So I give you the full sentences. 
but for purposes of the presentation, I'm picking two things that they talk about. <coughs> one is scientists disagree, and the other one is there is no survey or study showing consensus on the most important scientific issues. Well, I'm not sure what the IPCC is, but it sure is a survey. It certainly is a consensus. I see estimates of 97, 98% of the climate scientists in the world who actually believe that the planet is warming and that humans have a dramatic impact on it. So scientists don't, they disagree, but the vast majority don't, and there is a consensus, and there in fact has been a survey, and they wrote the 2015 report as a response to the 2014. So this is a very strange statement to make. Take the next one, no global warming for, and they say for some 18 years, that's, those are not my words. Uh, and we know what the NOAA plot looks like, and this we know is a simplified uh, time series, but uh, obviously the last 18 years there has been a temperature change, and if you look at the Arctic, there's been a bigger temperature change. There have been parts of the planet in which the temperature has not changed. Uh, that's because the heating effect hasn't necessarily gotten there, and because the heating, the so-called global warming, is more complicated, I shouldn't even say more complicated, it's only just beginning in the last few decades, and we're not, it's gonna be a while before we see absolutely everything, or mostly everything, warming. So let's go on to the next set of statements. This statement says 1979 to 2000, rate of surface warming within natural limits. This one says two degrees, a warming of two degrees centigrade is not harmful. Uh, melt and melting of Antarctic sea ice is not an unnatural state. And you can see, I'm going back to the stuff I showed you before. It's like, I don't think they ever read IPCC. Uh, here, of course, is to prove that this time period is outside of natural limits, is the plot that I showed you before. Uh, if you think that two degrees centigrade uh, warming doesn't have an impact, these are the projections for drought by about 2070. And we can show from our ice core records, I didn't show you the information, but uh, we can show from our ice core records that 4,200 years ago during a relatively warm time, within a matter of a couple of years and an abrupt climate change, there was a collapse of the Mesopotamian Empire, and that, was correspond that corresponded to a decrease in sea ice in the North Atlantic, which, is, which means warming. Uh, and in fact, that region of collapse of the Mesopotamian Empire, major civilization, that took hundreds of years to build is exactly where modern day Syria, Iraq, and Iran are. And it's one, today, that drought is one of the underpinnings uh, for the Arab Spring. And the other place that our ice core records and other people's records uh, have been able to demonstrate there's a correspondence between warming temperatures, <coughs> drought, uh, and an abrupt occurrence is in Central America with the collapse of the Mayan Empire. So two degrees cent, these were probably much smaller than two degrees centigrade warming. Two degrees centigrade warming is a very, very big deal. And let's look at melting of the Arctic sea ice, not a, a natural state. Well, I contend, granted it's just our data, saying that the last, that the, this, our recent uh, sea ice extent change or decrease in, in summer sea ice is equivalent to what we had 11 and a half thousand years ago. Granted, it's just our work, but there are actually other ways of demonstrating that too. So that doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, and then let's take the last two. Literally, you could go through every single one of these. It's not to say that there isn't some amount of discussion related to some of these. For example, solar variability. Solar variability is, has a very dominant control in the climate system until greenhouse gases begin to mask that effect and solar variability effects get significantly dampened out. So yes, solar variability is important. Solar variability impacts uh, ozone levels, but it's operating at a much lower level of magnitude than greenhouse gas warming. So their last two comments that I, I'm dealing with here are that uh, according to NIPCC, we should seek broader advice than IPCC uh, and we should deal with real problems. So looking outside of IPCC, there are tons of other documents. Forget about the ones that come out of, of government. Uh, this one up here comes from the World Bank. They talk about a rise in temperature. This one does come from government. This is the Department of Defense, which has been for years now preparing itself for a warmer climate and for an abrupt change in climate. Take a look at Swiss Re, 
uh, the reinsurance company, they have no doubt that the climate uh, is warming. And also this document called Risky Business that's come out of, the, out of Bloomberg also. So industry, uh, military, World Bank, reinsurance companies. So, oh, and then the la their last comment, or the one I deal with, deal with real problems. I would contend that these are real problems. Now, the la one of the uh, imp last important statements in the IPC summary is this one. And if you take a look at it, it says effective adaptation and mitigation responses will depend upon policies and measures. And this is one of the things that really upsets, uh, in the case of the Heartland Institute, their organization a lot. Their president was pushed by an MB MSNBC reporter quite a, quite a while ago, and the reporter kept saying, well, you know, is it, is it the science? And what is it about climate? And ultimately, they responded that, no, we just don't want federal regulation. I've tried to make the case that federal regulation is extremely important, uh, and that there have been great, great results thus far. And obviously, we have a long way to go, particularly with, with greenhouse gases. Now, here's the really scary part. That was the best that they had to offer that I could find. It was the best comparison to the IPCC. And I think it's great that they actually wrote down and they put their cards on the table. But they're now sending out, right now, 200,000 copies of this report to science teachers with a statement that basically says, you really need to show this to your students because obviously there are two 50-50 sides to climate change. To me, this is a really important thing to understand. Uh, and it's critical that if you know science teachers, students in school, uh, that you alert them to this. Not tell them, don't, I don't believe we should tell them not to read it. I believe that we should tell them to look at it and compare it to the IPCC. It's a great, great exercise. Now the fourth actually comes from this university, our institute. It's called Climate Futures. And it is an offshoot, or I should say, it is a descendant of the IPCC because the IPCC ends up saying that we need to think more about regional differences. They are not necessarily well accounted for. And we need to think about abrupt nonlinear change not accounted for in IPCC. Uh, and we need to do this in order to produce effective policies because the things that impact us in the climate system and already impact us in the climate system are not the same all over the world. For a place like Maine, we're going to have a lot of water. I'll show you wh why we might not have water occasionally, but in general, we're going to have a lot of water. But we have lime tick coming in. We have uh, uh, changes in levels of heating. We have our, and storms, we have our own concerns. There are parts of the world, however, that are in far, far worse shape than we are. So effective policies are at the national and the international level. And for climate futures, it's a whole big framework that we've developed. I'll just give you a couple of quick examples why I think it's a, it's a, it's a really good way to go. One of these I've already discussed. We developed this air quality app. Climate change is not just temperature. It's also air quality. And we developed, largely due to Sean Burkle, this thing called Climate Reanalyzer. So we've developed accessible, transparent data we get 1,000 to 1,500 hits a day uh, on Climate Reanalyzer. It appears in major newspapers all the time. It's a tool for the public and for researchers. Uh, and if you, you can go to Climate Reanalyzer and answer some very interesting questions for yourself. For example, what's the day-to-day -day perspective? When we look at the weather, we find out that today Maine is uh, generally cold, it should have been a little warmer on this day, the coldest it's ever been is such, the warmest it's ever been, and that's really important and it provides perspective, but you really want to look at the whole world. And on this particular day, which is March 24th, I should have done today, uh, we find out that, yeah, Maine was cold as it is today, but compare it to the world temperature for those days the, and the tropics, the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, the Arctic, 4.59 degrees higher than the baseline 1979 to 2000, and even the Antarctic is warmer. So it really has to do with where the jet stream is, where the cold air and warm air masses are coming in. You can get seasonal, yearly, and decadal perspective. I showed you some examples already. You can find out 
how Maine or the United States or any part of the world is impacted by major phenomena like the Indian monsoon that I started talking about, and also the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a much larger feature. It's a mechanism by which the Pacific Ocean basically modulates how warm it is. And it turns out that during an El Nino, which we just experienced last year, uh, if you look at the correlation between El Nino and in this particular case, precipitation, the blue tells you that most of the United States gets a little bit wetter during an El Nino, Maine gets drier. And that's exactly what happened to us just now. We went through, along with New Hampshire, a period of drying. So we likely should expect during El Ninos to be drier. And we can find out what happens during volcanic events. What do particularly warm years versus wet years? What does a longer season look like and how does it translate? The other thing that we can do with Climate Reanalyzer, and there's tons more, is to look at a commodity, Maine potatoes. How do Maine potatoes relate to climate? So you can see how they relate to summer water availability and all the things you can read. And the answer is Maine potato production is well correlated with an increase in moisture in the summer, with increase in temperatures in the Gulf of Maine, when the, and with westerly winds that weaken because they allow more warm air to go farther north. And that means that you get a longer fall season and better potato production. So one of the most interesting things that Bloomberg did with his team was to write a report about how corn crops will vary uh, over Midwestern United States under IPCC suggested temperatures. And that's great, and the figures are phenomenal, but we have a way now in which if you happen not to be growing corn in the Midwest, but you're growing rice uh, in the middle of Asia, you can actually see how rice production relates to a whole variety of climate parameters and make better predictions for the future. So here's, I think, what you can do if you choose to based on what I said today. You can talk to people who are teacher science teachers and students and say, you know, look at the NIPCC report. There are tons of hard copies out there. You can download it from the web, but also download the synthesis report for IPCC, 32 pages, and compare them for yourself. Which is a better scientific product? Which makes more sense? Which is scientific evidence? And which is alternative facts? You can look at 10green.org, climatereanalyzer.org, publicly available physical and chemical uh, data, transparent, accessible, and, easy, and beautiful graphics. You can support environmental legislation. It works. And there is no doubt whatsoever that it works. You can understand and prepare for challenges by understanding how the climate has changed where you live with Climate Reanalyzer, how air quality has changed, and you can even look at projections for the future. And if you have a time series for any kind of commodity, you can see how that might be related. And you can, if you're careful in thinking, and it doesn't matter what field you're in, uh, science, business, policy, on and on and on, you can create opportunities. If you could predict what the stock market would do in the next few years, we would be doing very, you'd be doing very well. I contend that we can do better in terms of predicting climate than you can predicting what's going on in the stock market. So we've entered the age of climate decision, and our actions are going to determine the, our health, the health of the planet, and the course of our civilization. Thank you.